back here, get back here, get, get I'm done. No, 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 now stop whining and do your goddamn job! Can I just go out there and tell him it sucks? Quick and painless? No, proper review, now! I don't pay you to stand around! You don't pay me, I don't make money off of this. NOW! FINE! Well, as you can tell, I'm not exactly excited about this. But, as I have taken it upon myself to share and spread my knowledge of Halo lore, the show must go on. So, just over a week ago, the final novel of the Kilo 5 series released, Mortal Dictata. With a prologue and two chapter previews, I was extremely excited for this book. It looked to cover some very interesting issues and had an exciting lead into Halo 4, much like Salentium. Perhaps it was my own fault for getting my hopes up, but as I'm sure you've all guessed, I was not exactly satisfied with this book. There's a lot to go over, so let's not waste any more time. This is Halo, Mortal Dictata. I'll get a few things out of the way before we get into the summary. This book only deals with Anesia and Naomi's past. Jewel is out of the picture, Halsey is left to her own devices, while characters with no right to do so take the moral high ground, and Blue Team is never mentioned. So right off the bat, there aren't many Halo 4 relevant topics covered in this book. Anyway, the book picks up with Naomi and Vaz on Venezia. The Kilo 5 crew is looking to recover Pious Inquisitor, a covenant vessel with a long history. And of course, it's being sold to Naomi's father and a wanted terrorist, Stefan Sensky, by a Kigar named Fel. Meanwhile, Avumad Talcum is also in search of Inquisitor and is looking to hire a Kegar for the job. A skirmisher by the name of Chol Vaughn takes the job, though she secretly wants the ship to start a Kegar navy to prevent any alien force from threatening them again. An insurrectionist wants the ship for offense, a Kegar for defense, and Oni for data. Three factions, one goal. I think now is a good time to interrupt the review and talk about the first major thing that annoyed me with this book, the aliens. Whenever we are focused on the Sangheili or Kegar, they are constantly making references to human sayings. Now, I know the Covenant studied humanity for quite a while, and many individuals would be familiar with human culture and ideas. However, what's the point in dealing with alien cultures and ideas if all you're going to do is make comparison to human cultures? It ruins the alien feel and comes off as nothing more than an analog of human culture with no depth of its own. Why not make up some Sangheili and Kig Yar sayings instead of constantly saying, Oh, the humans have a saying for this situation! As annoying as this is, I will compliment the book on trying to explore Kig Yar culture. I generally liked the idea in Glasslands when they took a look at Sangheili culture, and it was nice to take a look at the Kigyar too. Sadly, not too much is really revealed, but the whole idea of the Kigyar trying to form a proper military to keep things like the Covenant, or any foreign intruder for that matter, from dominating them again, is in fact interesting. Sadly, I cannot say the book really went anywhere with this. As we'll see later, this Kigyar thing is more like background noise than an important plot point. On Venezia, Naomi is pulled out and replaced by Mal, so Naomi can oversee a shipment of weapons to Talcum. Stefan, in the meantime, takes a look at Pious Inquisitor and ends up buying it from Fel, even securing a Huragok, and sometimes sinks, to maintain the ship. With a ship in hand, Stefan starts looking for a crew, and eventually hears of Mal and Vaz, whom have been making names for themselves as XUNSC. Stefan brings the two to Inquisitor, now being called Naomi, and decides that they are just the people he's looking for. Unfortunately for Mal and Vaz, the two forgot to bring Bibi, the only AI that's been helping Kilo 5 since the beginning. As such, the two hope for another invitation to visit Inquisitor or to try and remotely insert BB via transmission. They do eventually try the latter, but BB is blocked by Sinx. In another quadrant of the galaxy, Chol is busy finding Fel. She eventually tracks him to Venezia and kidnaps her fellow skirmisher for questioning. With enough coaxing and promises of anonymity, Fel shows Chol where Inquisitor is. Chol and her crew are forced to cut their way into the ship and split up to take control. Unfortunately for them, Sinx is an oddball when it comes to Huragok and very loyal to Stafan, and locks the skirmisher teams in different sections of the ship. Following orders from Stafan in case of an enemy incursion, Sinx moves Inquisitor to a new location. On Venezia, word of Fel's disappearance and the attempted hack on Inquisitor reaches Stafan's ears. Immediately, he suspects Mal and Vaz and kidnaps the both of them. Bibi, who had been keeping track of them, informs Osman of the ODST's disappearance. Osman naturally has Naomi and Devro prep for a rescue mission. Meanwhile, as Mal and Vaz are tortured, though nothing more than punches and kicks, Vaz decides to hint to Stafan that he knows about the fate of Naomi, possibly saving the lives of the two ODSTs, certainly giving them more time to be rescued. Several hours after their disappearance, Vaz and Mal are rescued by Devro and Naomi, respectively. When Vaz is rescued, he decides to bring Stefan with him, 
both to find Pius Inquisitor and to give him a chance to meet his daughter. On board Port Stanley, a deal is struck between Stefan and Osmond. Stefan will show the crew where Inquisitor is. In return, Osmond will allow him to talk to Naomi and allow her, if she so chooses, to leave the UNSC. So, after a few very heartwarming scenes with Naomi and Stefan, Naomi decides to try and recover her memories from early childhood. With the help of Bibi and Oni records, Naomi is able to remember quite a bit, including her kidnapping and early training with her fellow Spartans. Naturally, this leads her to hating Halsey now, since we didn't have enough characters doing that. So, once again, let's stop our review and talk about something. This time, let's talk about the butchering of Eric Nyland's work. We all know that certain elements of early fiction, notably Nyland's books, have since been revised by newer stories and lore. Most of these are minor, such as when humanity first encountered certain covenant species, or when the BR came into service, so on and so forth. However, I feel a grievous crime has been committed with Hilo 5, specifically Mortal Dictata. The original New Prince of Fall of Reach all mentioned that Halsey decided to tell the Spartan recruits the truth of their mission, that they had been taken from their families, wouldn't be allowed to return, and all for the sake of humanity. Halsey's journal backs this up. Now, with Mortal Dictata, we suddenly get a new story out of nowhere. Here, Halsey lied to the recruits, even telling Naomi that her father had allowed her to be taken. In Fall of Reach, Halsey outlined the risks of lying to the Spartans. In Pariah, she openly gave Soren choices regarding his recruitment into the Spartan 2 program and undergoing augmentation. Now suddenly she's lying to the kids, unnecessarily I might add. It's a terrible bit of writing that exists only to make Naomi hate Halsey for reasons I cannot comprehend. Moving on with the story, sometimes Sinx tries to make contact with Stefan. While Kilo 5 is able to locate Pius Inquisitor, it ends up taking too long to fetch Stefan. As a result, Sinx refuses to take new orders unless it sees Stefan in person. You know, I hate to stop again so soon, but I do have to compliment 343 on the idea of a quote-unquote broken Huragog. It's different, it actually plays an important and relevant part of the story, and there's actually some payoff to it. Anyway, Kilo 5 makes their way to the Inquisitor, and Stefan convinces Sinx to allow himself and Vaz on board. Naturally, BB has Vaz sneak a fragment of the AI aboard to take control of the ship. After landing in the shuttle bay, Vaz and Stefan are able to meet up with Sinx. Stefan has Sinx open a communications channel throughout the ship to try and convince the Kid Yard to go peacefully. Naturally, they refuse. Vaz then uses this distraction to upload BB into the ship. For a second, all seems to be going according to plan until Sinx isolates BB in the ship's computers, cutting off access to drives and weapons. Outside, with no word from BB, Naomi and Mal force their way into Inquisitor. Once inside, they are able to communicate with BB via the same comm channel that Stefan had used before. However, the whole ship can hear the conversation. Aware of the situation, Mal and Naomi begin to make their way to the bridge, taking out Kid Yard resistance along the way. Just before they make it to the bridge, Tolvan decides she's had enough. She orders her remaining crew near the ship's reactor to set some of the ship's torpedoes to detonate. With about 15 minutes, Kilo 5 tries to make an escape. Stefan goes off by himself in a spirit, determined to reach the starboard shuttle bay where Naomi is headed. Vaz and BB take their dropship, which is equipped with a slipspace drive courtesy of the Huragot leaks, and begin to move to a safe distance. At the starboard shuttle bay, Devro picks up Naomi and Mal. Sinks stays behind to try and fix the ship. Vaz has BB give Stefan Naomi's file as final proof that he wasn't crazy. Stefan makes a deal with Vaz, vowing to cease aggression towards Earth if Vaz takes care of Naomi. Naturally, Vaz agrees. BB tells Stefan that he won't be able to get away with a spirit's conventional drives, but also notes that Sinks had apparently installed a slip space drive on the dropship. To ensure Stefan would be able to live a life free from Oni, BB voluntarily erases their conversation from his memory. Content with that, Stefan makes a final run to try and save Sinks. As Vaz and BB make their jump, it looks like Stefan won't have enough time to get away before the ship explodes. After a debriefing with Peransky, Osman decides to finally look at her Spartan file and discovers her past. It turns out she was the daughter of a prostitute, often ignored and starving. She was taken by child services a few times, but ultimately found her way back to her birth mother. The only person who ever took an interest in the young Saren was her school teacher, a woman named Alchemy Leandro. It would seem that Halsey had actually given Saren a better and arguably longer life than she could have expected otherwise. As the book comes to a close, Osmond decides to give Kilo 5 some shore leave on Cascade, her homeworld, and one that had gone untouched by the Human Covenant War, where she intends to meet up with her old school teacher. Vaz, meanwhile, receives a mysterious package from an unknown sender. It contains a tiny wooden chair and a holographic star chart, two gifts intended for Naomi when she was six. Upon showing this to Naomi, the two take it as a sign that Stefan is alive, but decide not to mention it to anyone else. The epilogue was probably one of the best parts. It is a suicide note from Dr. Graham J. Alban, a man who worked in the Spartan 2 program and whose brain would be used to create Black Box, as were his wishes. The note is dated 2523 in the book, but apparently that's a typo meant to say 2532. Well, there we go. Mortal Dictata. The book is easily the worst Halo novel I've read to date and contains so much padding I actually fell asleep reading it a few times. 
For reference, I often power through the books in one night, usually without trouble. While Mortal Dictata does contain some interesting ideas, overall I feel like it was a waste of a book. The story starts out interestingly enough, but most of it never really goes anywhere. As Mortal Dictata doesn't pay off much, I'm sad to say that my opinion of the entire trilogy has dropped. Think about it like this. What ultimately changed? Not much in my opinion. Most of the characters never go through any dynamic arcs with the possible exception of Naomi and Saren. However, these character changes were boring and took three books to pay off, with the majority of their character evolution happening in the third book. To me, that just means that much of the Kilo 5 trilogy could have been condensed into a single book without much loss to the overall story. The subplots about Pius Inquisitor and Chol Vaughn ultimately don't go anywhere, with no real payoff in the end. Sure, Stefan is no longer a terrorist, but if Pius Inquisitor had never been stolen, then Stefan would just be a terrorist with no real way to threaten the UNSC. And of course, regardless of which way you went, there are still plenty of other disgruntled colonists out there. The arc with Chol Vaughn only really served to give us a look at Kigar's society, and that's barely developed. Ultimately, her story goes nowhere, and I don't expect any sort of payoff in any future media. The only subplot I found interesting was the stuff about the morality of the Spartan 2 program, but that didn't take off until the last 150 pages of the book. This was one of the selling points of the Kilo 5 trilogy, and it took three books for anything to fucking happen! Well, let's end this review before I start seeing red. If it isn't clear, this book is a terrible Halo novel, and I would only recommend getting it to finish off the trilogy. You really aren't missing much. Mortal Dictata gets a 4 out of 10. This has been Halo Canon. I need to go lie down. <laughs>